Hi everyone, I'm Linda Sheldon Fell with the International Grief Institute and this is Moments of Hope and Happy New Year to you. I hope for those of you that weathered the holiday season with a heart that felt raw, I, I hope and pray that it was a gentle season for you and that January is now a fresh look forward into 2019, uh, which you know I love the new year. It's always an opportunity to kind of start fresh and um, start with a new um, chapter that's yet unwritten and we get to be the author of our own story for the whole entire year. And so I hope for you that 2019 will be uh, rich with many blessings. And um, Moments of Hope is a show that features people who have turned ordinary um, their, their own ordinary story. And when I say ordinary, a lot of people share the same story, right? Um, and so this show is about people who've turned their pain into passion to do good in the world. And we are also, as we move into 2019, we're going to start mixing it up a bit by introducing compelling topics related to grief, healing, and hope. And so tonight we are kicking it off 2019 with my dear friend, Dave Roberts. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you, Linda. It's great to be here with you again. It's great to have you here again. And we are talking about reincarnation. And I, I want to um, introduce you to the viewers properly, Dave. You are a psychology professor and you are a clinical social worker. You've got a master's degree. You are a Compassionate Friends chapter leader. Mm -hmm. And this, um, a largely your world has shifted and changed, including your belief system mm -hmm. since the loss of your daughter in 2003. And so tonight we're talking about reincarnation. So tell me as a, as a clinical, um, you know, clinician, and also as a professor of psychology, prior to losing your daughter, what was your belief about reincarnation and life in general and death? Well, Linda, personally, I didn't believe in reincarnation. I didn't believe that there was life after death. I didn't believe in uh, signs from our loved ones. I lived specifically in a world that was dictated by you know, rational behavior, behavior that I could observe with my own five senses, in fact, I was very vehement in my rejection of any other type of metaphysical explanations for behavior, spiritual explanations for behavior, even sacred uh, explanations for behavior. I was firmly rooted in my beliefs. And I had and a was that because of your education, your educational background, or was that even before uh, you choosing your career path? I think it was even before, Linda. I, my mother, God rest her soul, was a very spiritual, very intuitive person. She believed in psychic phenomena and she believed in after death communication. And, you know, we had had some, some, you know, disagreements about that. And essentially I just rejected her own, her, her point of view. I never bothered to witness it. I never bothered to listen to it. I never bothered to even consider it. But that piece has, has changed drastically for me over the years in terms of my belief with that. And so, um, and viewers, I want to encourage you, if you've got thoughts, comments, questions, uh, feel free to type them in the thread. They will pop up here, um, and uh, I will read them to Dave, and we can have him answer questions. Um, and just feel free to share your thoughts. Even if we don't reply to your comment, there, it'll still be in there in the thread for other viewers to see yep. and comment on. So please, everyone, join in. Um, and so was your daughter's death the catalyst for your shift in your belief, or was it something else? I, I think it was my daughter's death, particularly that was the catalyst for, for a shift in my beliefs. I realized that human law explanations weren't going to help me adjust to the, to the finality of my daughter's death and allow me to, to move on or embrace perspectives that could, you know, help me find on most days, you know, to embrace a peaceful perspective. So I think that was part of it. Another part of my education was um, a weekend that I had in Long Island with a good friend of mine who was a, uh, her name is Patty Farino. And this was back in 2010, where you know, she's an she's a interfaith minister, very intuitive, walks a sacred path. And 
for that en entire weekend that we were together, uh, my daughter chose to, to, to channel information through her about a variety of different things about, um, you know, the need for me to embrace not only being a bereaved father, but to embrace all aspects of my life experience. We also got into a discussion about past life experiences where, in fact, and I have all this written down. We there's I have a 14 page journal on this whole weekend and where we had talked about and Patty had asked me, do you believe in past life experiences? The first thing that came to mind was Brian Weiss. And at that particular moment, we started talking about soul contracting, the possibility and the fact that my daughter and I were connected in previous lifetimes. Um, and that her, her ultimate purpose after crossing over was to help me realize that love does exist on the other side by continuing to bond through, through uh, um, you know, signs that she regularly sent me and, you know, just other messages. So this, that spiritual awakening back in 2010 jump-started my awareness and really motivated me to continue to look into more aspects of reincarnation, ancestral healing, a variety of other different perspectives that we don't typically associate with traditional grief work, but are necessary, I believe, are necessary components for those who are willing to embrace them that will help them work through um, the raw pain of losing their loved ones. Okay. Okay. Really interesting. You brought up Dr. Brian Weiss. And for those who don't know who he is, um, he is an author. He's been on Oprah, uh, well known around the world. He's a graduate of Yale Medical School. And as a traditional psychotherapist, he did not believe in reincarnation. Nope. And then he had this one patient who had a lot of issues that she was facing and he decided to hypnotize her uh -huh. and he under hypnosis she started referencing things from what he kind of gathered was what he thought of as the in-between world yeah. and then she started talking about past life stuff while under hypnosis uh -huh. and that patient was a catalyst for dr weiss's thinking uh, to shift and now uh, he's written uh, many master many lives and many other books about um, all of this, what he's learned. And, you know, people, because again, just like you as a, uh, you know, a, um, a scholar and such, um, he was skeptic of mm -hmm. it, but this one patient changed everything. And, I, in fact, she started revealing information about Dr. Wise's family to him, including uh, from their, their uh, dead son. Yep. And so um, for viewers who have not read his books, they're really compelling and you can find them anywhere. Yep. And, uh, and he's a highly, uh, you know, his credentials are incredible. And so um, from, did you read that book then? Yes. Many Lives, Many Masters? I read the and, book. Yep, I read it twice. And so that had a profound effect on you. I think more so after the weekend with Long Island, it, with Long Island yeah. with Patty, I reread the book again and it was like everything just started to click with reincarnation, with past life experiences. The thing that was compelling to me for the, for the book was you mentioned his two-year-old son had died of a congenital heart defect. And I believe the subject and the, his patient whom we refer to as Catherine in between mm -hmm. lifetimes, he would advance her through hypnosis to the time of her death, and her soul would have what we call an incubation period. It would be a rust period before uh, she reincarnated into the, into the physical realm. And one of the things she was channeling ma messages through what she referred to as highly evolved master spirits. And one of the things that he had said, she had said to him, she channeled, was that that his son had had a backward, he was born with a backwards heart and that he died. And the purpose of his death was to show him the limitations of Western medicine. I believe Weiss probably, if there was a drop the mic in 1986, he would have dropped it. And he died. And also he recorded every one of these sessions as well with her, especially when he started doing regression hypnosis. And he said, I had never had a previous conversation with her about 
my family. There was no way she would have known that other than the fact that she was getting this information while her soul was, was uh, resting in another realm. She was channeling that information. There was no way she would have known that or even remembered that after she right. came out of hypnosis. So that was, I think, to him compelling evidence that, in fact, what he was ex- she was he was experiencing with her was past life regression. That was compelling evidence to me as well, too. When I read that again, I said, wow. I said it was just Very, like a wild moment. Yep. And you think of Dr. Weiss, for him to become, uh, you know, share this with people was really a risk for him Mm -hmm. because of his background and his credentials. This kind of thinking was not something that was embraced. And for him to be able to write a book about it and, you know, share what he stumbled across uh, was huge, huge risk. And yet, of course, it changed his, his whole life and it changed how he treated patients. He now uses it as a healing modality that, that past life regression, past life therapy uh, to help patients th- who've come to him where nothing else has helped. Yeah. And so um, really a fascinating person uh, to, and, and his book, I've read uh, you know quite a few of his books and they're all very compelling. Yeah. So um, but I, I love that the fact that he came from that skeptical background and uh, you know, not trained in that area and the, the trained thinking uh, were things, just as you said, that had to be um, you know, evidence-based. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so a um, really, really interesting um, person. Uh, what about the University of Virginia? There's a study done there that studied 1,200 children. Um, what do you, are you familiar with that study? Yeah. See, these are things back we talk about Brian Weiss's work and Ian Stevenson's work. Ian Stevenson is is um, you know he he's in he's in the, the spiritual realm now. He died several years ago, but his work is being carried carried on by I believe another individual by the name of Jim Tucker. And what Ian Stevenson did at the University of Virginia, um, he applied the scientific method. He compiled over twelve hundred cases involving young children who had spontaneous past life memories, they were objectively verified. And he found a variety of different characteristics that were consistent in the studies that he that he found. I'm gonna just, I have my notes in front of me, so I'm just gonna kind of read some of the findings to you. Um, that individuals can have the same facial features from lifetime, one lifetime to another. Traumatic wounds that occurred in one lifetime could result in birthmarks in the same anatomical location in, in other lifetimes. Um, souls can plan lifetimes to be reunited with loved ones. And what Brian Weiss mentioned, soul contracting, in his book where the the same group of souls will contract over different lifetimes through different relationships to experience different challenges for the purpose of the evolution of their souls. Um, The manner of death in a past lifetime may result in phobias in a subsequent lifetime. Souls can change religion, nationality, and ethnic affiliation from one incarnation to another, which he says is an observation that can help create a more peaceful world. So it's quite possible that in one lifetime I may have been Native American, in another lifetime I might have been been black, in another lifetime I might have been Asian. So again, that was those were the experiences in the physical body that my my soul asked for, contracted for, so that I could. You know, so that my soul could evolve from a variety of different perspectives. Um, okay. And the other piece with this as well, too, and I think this is in, I had read this either online or some other notable publication, that also traumatic death, the soul has free will as does the flesh. The soul can opt to reincarnate sooner after a death such as like homicide or suicide, they can choose to reincarnate sooner because that contract was abruptly um, was abruptly snapped. So those are just some other things that were, were compelling to me. Um, you know, and there's also other evidence that we may have done this more than once as well, too. Well, um, let's talk about soul contracts, too, uh, yep. before we um, get too far away from it. Explain what that is. Um, I am going to paraphrase this as best as I can, and this is, again, my perspective. What Brian Weiss talked about in his group book was something called soul groups, that 
the same group of souls will choose to exercise free will and reincarnate with the with each other and contract to meet in past in, in future lifetimes with different relationships. So let's say, for example, your husband could have been your brother in a previous lifetime. My daughter could have been my wife in a previous lifetime. I, we could have been brother and sister in a previous lifetime. My wife and I could have been brother and sister in a previous lifetime. But essentially, we're the, the same group of souls that that just reincarnate, and we contract for the type of challenges that we are go, we're going we're going to address. And that part of it, particularly when I first heard about that, sounded really unbelievable to me because why in why in the world would I want to contract to be a parent who would experience the death of a child? Why would I willingly right. sign up? That's for what's that? going through my head. Yeah, why would I willingly sign up for that? Um, but again, from a from a, a sacred perspective, from a, a past life perspective, it may make it may make more sense looking at it from that perspective than it would from a human law perspective. Because many times I looked and I said, "What was my soul thinking?" I look up at the sky and said, "What was my soul thinking? Why would I do this? Why would I do such a thing?" And not, yeah. all, not only that, Linda, but I have danced with that since I've been five years old. Loss has been instricably woven into my DNA since I've been a kid, from the day that my father left and never came, never returned, to losing you know uh, my maternal grandmother, my aunts, friends, and then my daughter. I mean, and, and I've had subsequent losses since then, and so it's like, I, this is, why would I willingly even choose to do this? That's really interesting because some people say that loss is part of life. It is. But there's also this thinking that goes through my head. And just for the record, um, you know, I, I am a Christian. I was yep. baptized in the Lutheran church. Mm -hmm. My mom was a Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I belong to Young Life. And, I, and so that is my upbringing. But I've also had experiences both prior to losing my daughter and subsequent after uh, that has caused me to reflect and and think and so reincarnation is it's part of a lot of belief systems um yep. you know a lot of native um cultures believe in reincarnation yep. um buddhism yep. uh, hinduism yep. a lot of the asian uh, religions mm -hmm. uh, you know believe in it and yet here in America, uh, you know, Christians predominantly believe that that is the work of the devil and that the Bible says that you live, you died, and you either go to heaven or hell based yep. upon how you lived. And end of story. And so when I, you know, lost Ellie, first off, I, I want to share something that happened before I lost Ellie. And okay. so I'm going to share this and then you give me your thoughts on it. Two years before she died, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was in a car in a in a, the front passenger seat. My sister was the driver and Allie was sitting behind my sister and the car flew off the road and landed in the lake and sank. And my sister and I escaped the car and Allie did not. And the only thing that she left behind was this open book floating face down on the water. And that dream was so real to me. It was so scary. And then two years later, our daughter, Allie, died in a car accident as a backseat passenger coming back from a swim meet. And so I think back on that dream and it gives me comfort to believe that God was giving me a heads up. Mm -hmm that he was saying that this is to come mm -hmm. and there's a reason for it. Now, Ellie has uh, come to me in a dream after her death. And actually, uh, just this last year, uh, she came to me right before I was going to the Compassionate Friends National Conference and uh, the night before I was flying out. And she said, Mom, we have to be apart in this lifetime to learn lessons. And that is what she said to me. And so with that being said, it's really hard 
for people who are raised as Christians, who believe in the, the Christian doctrine that, um, you know, that reincarnation exists as a possibility, yet I'm just going to be candid here and say that it gives me comfort mm -hmm. to believe in reincarnation. It gives me comfort to think that, you know, if I don't get it right this lifetime, God's not going to send me to hell. No. That right. I only have one shot at this. And, you know, the God I believe in is a loving God. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that we evolve each time and learn and try to do better on subsequent in subsequent lives, um, it, it brings me a lot of comfort. But I know a lot of Christians would throw me under the bus for that. And so yeah. what is that? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last question. I think we broke up a little bit. A lot of Christians would throw me under the bus for saying that, mm -hmm. um, that you know, reincarnation, yet that dream that I had two years before Allie died about her dying mm -hmm. came true. Yeah. So, and, you know, people- How are gonna, do I do that? You, you don't, people are gonna believe what they believe. And I, you know, I, I can respect somebody who doesn't believe in an afterlife, who doesn't believe in reincarnation. All I know is what I can validate through my heart, through my soul and through my own experience. If in fact, and anything, and I and I had a good friend of mine, Carla Blowey, Blowey, always said this to me. She said, signs are a product of what's happening with us at the present moment. Whatever is happening with that dream with Allie, that was to me a premonition dream. That was a sign of things to come. How much different is that? Like in my daughter's case, she was asking my, my wife about cancer in the physical world two years before she died. So what's the difference? The difference is that she's doing it in the physical world. Who's to say that my daughter didn't have a premonition two years prior to her illness that she was gonna get sick and die? What's the Well, difference? it's interesting that you, you bring that up because Allie, about six months prior to the accident where she did die, uh, she had a fear that we would be separated, that she would die. Yeah. And um, I I didn't understand where it was coming from. And I would say, yes, love you. We're going to be together forever, always. Mm -hmm. And and then she died. And so in looking back on that, you know, my brain can't help but try to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And I think that this is what's really compelling about this idea of, uh, you know, reincarnation that is accepted by many people and not accepted by others is that as a bereaved mother, am I grasping at straws? Is this, is this something that I want to believe because I want to believe I'll see Allie again? Yeah. And, and I phrase it that way because um, I believe that we go to heaven. I believe that when we die, we go to heaven and I will reunite with her. Mm -hmm. But is it possible that she might come back before I die as a newborn baby like my great grandchild or something? Mm -hmm. And it's also possible possible that a part of her soul can reincarnate into the physical physical world, since it's where it's all about energy anyway. And the rest of the the renter of her soul can stay in the afterlife. She can be in two places at once, literally two dimensions at once. So, oh, interesting. Okay. Because when we talk about energy, energy can be anywhere. It can be simultaneous. If you look at time in the afterlife, what I've read about, there's no time in the afterlife. You don't need a wristwatch. Five minutes could be like fifty years. So it's quite possible that when you do cross over, that Allie might be reincarnated. But if she into another body, it might not see you at the time that you 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 cross. But fifty five years or seventy five years is like two minutes in the afterlife. So it'll be a matter mm -hmm. of no time. You'll be, but you'll also see relatives you probably didn't even know you had, which will be the other thing. So you'll be reunited with other relatives from your current life, perhaps even past lives that you hadn't even known that you had. And, and so what do you say when someone of a, of a, a conservative belief questions that? Um, because I know my experiences. Mm -hmm. I know of the dream, you know, prior to Allie's death, that was a premonition. I, I know that she came to me after multiple mm -hmm. times in a dream saying, you know, mom, this was the way it was supposed to be. And every dream is, 
very similar, that it was full of love. It was not a scary dream. Mm-hmm. It was full of love. And so to me, you can't tell me that's the work of the devil. Anything no. that brings me comfort is not the work of the devil. And so I, I want to know what viewers think about this. Um, you know, Dave, you and I both have the experience, the shared experience of losing a daughter. Yep. And yet our backgrounds are different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and our, our, the way that we were raised is, is different and such. And so it's interesting that we have this shared connection on the idea that reincarnation um, is a viable, plausible possibility. Mm-hmm. And so I want to see what um, viewers have to say about this. And then I've got some stats to share as well. I need to put on my cheater so I can read some of the comments. Okay. All right. So Uma Garish. Oh, Uma, hello. Oh, my gosh. She is one of the founders of the International Grief Council. So hello, Uma. That's wonderful. Heather Sting. She says, I have heard that Christianity originally did promote reincarnation though I've not researched it myself. And that's really interesting because there are some scholars who say that reincarnation was part of the original Bible, but through the Council of Nicaea, the Catholic Church took it out. And so what do you what are your thoughts on that, Dave? Well, I'm not an expert specifically on, on the religions of the world, but I do know that there have been various interpretations of Catholicism of the Bible. So to me, I guess it would depend on what interpretation of the Bible that you're reading, um, you know, based on what your what your you know what your current beliefs are. So, you know, I and I think everybody's going to have a different interpretation. Everybody's going to have a different belief system. You asked the question, well, "What would I do if somebody who was conservative questioned or said I don't believe it?" That's fine. I'd want to find out a little bit more of what the basis of their belief is because I might be able to learn something from it. And the only prerequisite I would have is just, you know, just listen to my side. And my job is not to convince anybody else that my reality is their reality. My job is right. to present from my perspective, this is my experience that led me to this. So tell me, what are your experiences that have contributed to your own beliefs? I may be able to learn something. I may be able to research something that may help me, um, help me, you know, develop that different perspective. Plus the other thing I've learned is, is I try not to leak unnecessary energy, you know, at all. I've learned that that my energy has been precious, particularly after my daughter's death. Energy was at a, at a low supply for me. So I've learned in later grief, what am I going to choose to leak my energy on? What, am, what, you know, what cause am I going to choose to leak my energy on? How do I know when I can, I can push a point, when I can try to convince an individual to look at a different perspective, or when do I need to let it go? It's, it's, you know, my friend Patty says, what do you believe? It's everybody believes what they're going to believe. It's our job to kind of witness it rather than judge it. So I would, I would welcome a discussion with anybody who didn't believe and say, and there's, there are probably grounds for, you know, one of the, one of the things that um, there's scientific consensus. One argument that past life memories don't exist is something called cryptonesia. Okay, is a phenomenon called cryptomnesia, which are narratives that are created by the subconscious mind using imagination, forgotten information, and suggestions from the therapist. Now, I don't know if you remember the whole movie with Sybil, with Sally mm-hmm. Field. There was some question that, in fact, the, the subject of that film wasn't didn't have multiple personality disorder, but essentially was led to believe that through the suggestions of a therapist. So it's quite possible. You know, that that's one possible explanation that past life memories don't exist. But I tell individual it's it's your own experience. And I can't consensually validate your own experiences. If I see your eyes lighting up and you're getting really excited, I got to figure that's real for you. Um, Right. That's real. for you. So I I need to respect that and I need to try to understand it without judging. I I love how you um, frame that. um, But I am a people pleaser. And so when people question, you know, this, that, or the other, uh, it feels very uncomfortable for me Mm -hmm. because I have my own experiences and I own those experiences, but within the church, I have been thrown under the bus. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me gun shy with talking about things outside what I was taught. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're talking about something like this tonight, because it's something 
that uh, it, it can be, you know, like politics, where people are very uh, strong in their opinions, they're set in their opinions, yep. and I want to learn from other people. And mm -hmm. the only way to do that is to have expert guests such as yourself on the show to share your side of it. And um, so I appreciate that. But it's it's very uncomfortable for me when people say, but how can you be a Christian if you believe in reincarnation? You know, that's a good question. And some would say, that I'm truly not a Christian then yep. if I believe in reincarnation because the Bible says what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But as you said, the Bible, there's, you know, there's the um, New Testament, the Old Testament. Um, you know, there's so many different interpretations of it that which one is the correct one. And then, of course, there is with religion with, you know, the Catholics believe this, the, the Protestants believe this, uh, you know, the, they, the, there's some truth to all of them. And to me, that truth is love. Mm -hmm. That's a common yeah. denominator among all of them. But then there are different belief systems within each one of them. And I remember um, I was at a, a funeral service for a teenage boy and I remember when the clergyman stood up there, and I won't say which um, church it was, but he said to everyone who was in attendance that the teenage boy who had died was going to be in purgatory until enough money was donated to the church for his soul to be released. And I remember standing in that service feeling horrified, and I hadn't yet become a bereaved mother, but I remember thinking, Oh my gosh, my poor friend whose son had died. What did that, you know, is she living in fear that her son is in purgatory? Mm -hmm. And and so belief systems, and I'm not saying that that's right or wrong either. I'm just saying that people have very strong beliefs. And so when we challenge one another, um, I'm, I'm going to try to adopt your style to turn it around and say, tell me about why you believe what you believe. Why is it not okay to believe in reincarnation? My understanding is that Jesus himself believed in reincarnation. Um, and some would say that, you know, the Bible prior to the Council of Nicaea, I talked about reincarnation readily. So it's, it's hard to know. Um, so uh, there are major religions that believe in rebirth. Yep. And, you know, Hinduism um, and, and let's see, I had it written. Oh, Hinduism, they believe in the cycle of rebirth is yep. referred to as the will of karma. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of goes back to what you were talking about, that karmic, um, mm -hmm. you know, that we're fulfilling some kind of karmic agreement. Mm -hmm. So want, oh, go ahead. Well, and so. Um, you had, I'm going to jump around a bit here. You had the session with the shamanistic holistic yeah. back uh, practitioner. In, back in 2012. Yeah. yeah. And so was that Hinduism, and I'm looking at my notes here because it's interesting to me that Hinduism, which, you know, there are millions of people are Hindu, mm -hmm. millions, mm -hmm. and they believe in that cycle of rebirth and in karma. And so... What did you learn when you had that session with uh, the uh, practitioner mm -hmm. about karma and reincarnation? Because you, there was something there that um, really changed your world. Well, it's hard to describe what a shaman does. I can't really yet kind of be there to see to see it. But what she usually does is she'll read my body energy, and based on what she's reading. You know, she will give me certain essences, organic essences that will help, you know, balance my, you know, my my energies. Um, one of the things that she'll do, and if she feels moved, she will put me on the table and essentially do a shamanic journey with me. And she did. She goes, you know, I moved this one day. She goes, I'm going to put you on the table. Sometimes she will tell me what she sees. Other times she will withhold it if she believes it will be harmful for me to to know that at that particular time. And I like that perspective because to me, that's ethical practice, whether you're talking about complementary therapies or whether you're talking about traditional therapy. And I firmly right. believe that too, that in terms of their timing is everything when you are presenting information to an individual, particularly something that can be life altering. So what happened is she put me on the table and she goes, I, when we got up, she goes, I saw a young four-year-old boy who was in a chariot with his father. And I'm assuming it was either ancient Egypt or Roman times. 
And she goes, the chariot overturned, crushing the four-year-old boy. Now, here's what happened. The session before that, we had done some ancestral work with my mother, okay? Um, and I, my, my mother, after my father had left, was overly protective of me to the point where I felt stifled and I was angry and I was resentful, okay, mm -hmm. and I, for a lot of years. And we had done that work, and I had come to an understanding of the nature of my resentment with, with Susan, who was my, my shaman. Um, and so I, we had come to that understanding, we began to process that. So what happened is when I got this, when she had this, this vision of me and another, I thought, I said, that was me. I was the four-year-old boy in another lifetime who had been killed. And this is what had come to me. My father was my father, my father then, I believe, was my father in my current lifetime who abandoned me. My mother wasn't there to protect me at all. And, and, and I think it was our sole contract that we were going to do this again as mother and son in another lifetime. And she was going to protect me at all costs, even if it irritated the heck out of me. Even and if stifled it, me. And stifled yeah. me and in the process alienated me. Her contract with me, and I'm getting chills talking about this, was to protect me at all costs. Wow. And that's, wow. and that's the first inkling I got of the fact that yeah, we've we've done this before. The other piece that Susan helped me uncover in a session with her is she also saw me in another lifetime where I was hung because of my spiritual knowledge. It was in, my spiritual knowledge was intimidating to those around me. So being hung because of my, and killed because of my spiritual knowledge, I began to believe that I was so vehemently against any type of, of metaphysical explanation for behavior because of the trauma I experienced in that past lifetime. I chose to kind of just reject everything. And it wasn't because I rejected spirituality. I was, I was embracing and I was, I was feeding into the fear I had of being killed because of that in a past lifetime. When my daughter died, after her death, and after I began to, to get strong communications from her with after-death communication, after my weekend in Long Island, I began to realize and I understood that her role on the other side was to show me that love truly existed, but also help me to get in touch with the spirituality that I had so vehemently rejected. So that was part of her contract with me in this lifetime, was wow. to help me get in touch with what I rejected. My goodness, that's pretty profound. Um, it's a little mind boggling, really, mm -hmm. to you know, think about it and mull it over. I wanna see what some other comments are that we have. Um, okay, so Evelyn Di Garcia. Uh, just because someone doesn't believe doesn't mean it's not true. Amen. Absolutely. We all have different belief systems, and it's really important for us not to judge one another's belief system. And uh, because those belief systems come from so many different facets of our life. And um, so well said. Well said. And, and, you know, I've, I've, got, I've got friends that are atheists that don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in, that God exists, but they're still my friends. You know, yeah, right. You know, that's it, right. They're still my that's friends. right. I mean, and I believe that that is what God wanted us to, uh, you know, to love our neighbors. We love ourselves. And I happen to be blessed with wonder, wonderful neighbors. But in the broadest sense of, of that statement is, you know, to be open and love one another, regardless of the differences. That's right. And if if only people lived that way, the world would be a, a whole different place. Well, Erica. The afterlife's all about love anyway. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The afterlife's all about love anyway. There's none of these other yeah, contracts right. on earth. So Erica Civil says, I absolutely believe we are all here for a purpose because we didn't fulfill what we needed to in a previous life. Reincarnation, absolutely. And so talking about the um, past lives, so with both of our daughters dying, and being a pivotal moment in our own tapestry of our, our own life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, I think that, um, you know, the, the idea of reincarnation 
uh, again, it for me, it, it brings me hope in that uh, there's a purpose to this. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is probably one of the hardest things that I see as a brief mom and as an educator is when someone says, well, my child or my loved one died, they're dust. That's it. And so for me, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, because that's not what I believe with my whole heart. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's hard to to uh, find a happy medium there and, you know, saying, well, but what if your child, you know, is still alive in the other world? And, and I want to preface that by saying that we are one of the families that, of millions around the world that have had interactions with Ali from heaven. Mm -hmm. Have you had that with your daughter? Um, I've had some brief dream visits with her. My wife is the one that's had more profound dream visits with her. Uh, one dream that I, I know she wouldn't mind me sharing is she she believed she met Janine in China. This was in her dream. And she truly believed that Janine was with, with Buddha. Um, and one of the things that Brian Weiss talks about in terms of how we, we know we may have had a past life experience is we have dreams about different cultures. If we're mm. drawn to different cultures, if there's a feeling of deja vu, like you've, you've done this before with somebody, um, and it's just not the power of positive attraction. It's simply the deep seated belief that you really have were connected in a previous lifetime with an individual. The, the other thing that he also mentioned, and I think that was, uh, is, is fascination with another culture. I'll give you an example from my own, my own experience. I am of Middle Eastern descent. I'm a Maronite Catholic. I'm, I'm, you know, I was raised Catholic. Um, but yet in Long Island, when I was with, with my friend Patty, she introduced me to the Native American teachings of animals and nature. I was automatically drawn to it. It was like it was something I, I, I had remembered because it was so effortless to me. And I've been drawn to the Native American beliefs regarding culture regarding um, animals in nature. And they, they've provided me with a lot of, those teachings have provided me with a lot of clarity. So how do you explain that? I'm a Middle Eastern guy. I love Middle Eastern food, but yet I'm drawn to Native American spiritual practices as it relates to, to, to culture, as it relates to animals in nature. How do you explain that? Um, is it possible that I could, that I could have walked with Patty or, or my wife or anybody else in the world of Native America? It's quite possible. Because how else right. do you explain the, the attraction? After eight years of walking, doing traditional grief work, after my daughter died, how do you explain that? I, I can't explain it. But right. yet I'm right. drawn to that. And that's part of, of that's part of, of the tools that are in my tool chest now that I use to uh, that continue to provide me clarity. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, I, I think about how, and this happens to pretty much everyone at some point in their life where they run into someone they've never met and they have that connection of like, don't I know you from somewhere? Or a sense of familiarity that can't be explained. And I wonder if that's someone from a past life. You know, I don't know because I'm in this lifetime and I don't have the, the benefit of being able to see outside my own little world. Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I believe that's possible. It makes yeah. sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, going back to that, that soul contract with losing a child, I, you know, there are some parents and, and, and I'm not, I don't want to exclude this just to child loss because I think that, um, you know, death is pivotal for all of us, regardless mm -hmm. of the loved one that we lost, but losing a child is my own experience. And, you know, what do you, for those people who say, well, um, you know, that's it then. And they, they don't find any healing because they, in their mind, feel that their loved one is dead, they're dust, and either in heaven or hell. And so if their loved one did not live a perfect life, if their loved one lived a life that was full of error, full of uh, illegal activity full of sins and they go to hell the parents 
you know, or the spouse or the sibling or the um, grandparents or the child are, are, are left thinking, oh my goodness, my loved one is in hell for eternity. I'll never see them again. And that's hard. That's really hard to wrap your brain around. Yeah, and so hard. for me, the idea, what's that? No, no, go ahead. I just, I was agreeing well, with The you. idea of reincarnation, if you have your, your heart open to it, um, I think it, it makes sense in a lot of ways and allows us to, uh, I think, open the door to healing in a way that the mm -hmm. belief that our loved one might be in hell does not. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. I, and I personally, and I'm Catholic, you know, I was raised with a dualistic philosophy. If you lived a good life, you were going to go to heaven. If you didn't, you were going to be, you know, you were going to be sent to the bowels of hell. I, I don't, I don't believe there is a hell. What I believe is that there are certain levels that we ascend in the afterlife that represent spiritual growth. We may start at okay. a lower level than others, but if we continue to evolve in this lifetime, we can evolve in the afterlife. And so we might start at a lower level of spiritual awareness based on what transpired with us in our current life, but there's room for growth as there's room for growth here. And I truly believe that. In the afterlife, it's just a world that's based on non-judgment, love, and uncond unconditional love and acceptance. Um, like, for example, you know, one of the things you'll hear are people who complete suicide, that suicide mm -hmm. is a sin, so they're going to be in eternal purgatory. I don't buy that for a minute. Um, I don't either. I don't, buy, I don't buy that for a minute. Is it possible that they could start out at a lower level of spiritual, uh, lower level of spiritual development? Sure. It's possible, but is there room for growth? Absolutely. And are they bound so to eternal purgatory? To you, are they bound to eternal purgatory? No, no. No, I don't believe that they are either. So I want to pose a question to you. What is the possibility that someone who dies by suicide in this lifetime is fulfilling a soul contract? It is quite possible that that could happen. And when you look at, I look at the whole thing with assisted suicide or, or physician assisted suicide. If you look at, you know, if you look at one of the more publicized cases was, was Brittany Maynard. And I don't know if you're familiar with, with her. She was about three years ago. She was diagnosed with a, a, a geoblastoma. Um, she had made a decision in conjunction with her family that she, she moved from California to Oregon to take advantage of death, of death with dignity law. And she ended up ending her life on her terms with her family by her side on November 1st, 2014. Her mission was to create awareness of the need for assisted death legislation in every state in the union. Not that it was a mandatory requirement for everybody to well, yeah, you, you know, if you're terminally ill, then that's the only option. She wanted that to be included as a choice for, her. and that was her, that was her mission in at the end of her, prior to the end of her life, was to create that type of awareness. So it's possible in that circumstance, is it possible that she might have been fulfilling a greater soul contract? Absolutely. And the other thing is to look at is, you know, and I think suicide is a very complicated complicated uh, thing to get into as well anyway, because there's so many different factors that play into it. Um, um, you know, so, you know, and I, I, I believe we're all, I believe that we're, we're all beautiful regardless of, of cause of death or stigmas that are attached to that. And that our lives shouldn't be judged based on the last, the last decision we make in our last moments or our last year, or, uh, you know, it's the totality of their life is what matters to me. And I, I think because right. of that, there's not any eternal purgatory for anybody who chooses to end their life by suicide. I don't buy it, and I, I would vehemently argue that point. Right, right. You know, the, the concept of hell and the idea that our loved ones might go to hell for all eternity uh, with no idea, or, you know, or no thought of reincarnation or anything um, is, for me, my God is a loving God. Yep. And it's it's hard for me to fathom that such a loving God would condemn someone to hell 
because they chose to die by suicide because they were in great agony. You know, suicide often happens when one's coping skills is exceeded by the pain that they're in and that they want that pain to stop. And, you know, as you said, suicide is very complex and there's yep. many facets to it, but in a simple sense, it's when the pain exceeds your coping skills um, in, in many situations. And so I can't believe that God would condemn them to hell for choosing to die by suicide. That's just not within my realm. And so, uh, you know, some viewers will undoubtedly I disagree with that, but that is just my own beliefs. Uh -huh. And that's what this show is about is talking about these subjects and mm -hmm. learning from one another. You know, it's, it's, um, we're all, you know, part of this world. And so we lean on and learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to take a, a few more um, comments here and then we'll wrap it up. Um, let's see. Oh, Heather, you're so sweet. Heather Stank says, thank you, Dave Roberts and Linda Sheldon Fail. Thank you, Heather, for joining us. If you have more comments, please put them in the thread uh, so that other people can benefit from your wisdom and your thoughts. And that goes for all of you who are viewing the show tonight. Uh, Uma, Diane Warner, Lori Smith, Evelyn Di Garcia, all of you. Um, so Lori Smith, uh, her comment is, I lost my only teenage son in September 2018. So just a few months ago, and Lori, I'm so, so sorry. Uh, she says, I am grieving heavily. How did you both heal slash recover? Because I am in so much pain. I haven't been able to connect with them yet. And so I'll share my thoughts and then Dave, you share your mm -hmm. thoughts. So first off, I'm so, so, so sorry for the loss of your son. There are no words to describe the heartache. There just are not any in any language. Uh, to be able to, uh, you know, share what the loss of a child does to our world. Um, but I, I want to say that healing came about for me uh, through a series of steps, some of which um, were proactive steps and some of which were little wisdoms that I gained from people around me. And uh, it was a very dark time. I actually remember thinking in those early years of losing Ellie, and I say years, you heard that right. You didn't hear months, you didn't hear days. It's the early years. And I say that because many people think that within a few months, we have, we've healed, we're, you know, we've moved on. And really it's about learning to move forward with your loved one in your heart. And that's a huge transition. And so for me, the healing came about from a series of steps, but, what I want to pass on to you, Lori, and anyone else who is freshly grieving loss of someone that they loved with all their being is that one day it won't always feel so raw. One day, joy and laughter will return to your world. It will be in little bits at first. Sometimes they're so small, you won't even recognize it. But if your heart is open, that joy and that laughter will grow and you will learn that the heart can hold joy the same time as sorrow. You don't have to choose. It can have, your heart is that big. It is that, it can hold many emotions at the same time. And so when laughter and joy and beauty re-enter your world, your new world, let it be. Allow it, honor that as much as you honor the pain. And one day, your world will have more joy and beauty in it than you ever thought possible. And that is what I want to leave you with, because I remember in those early, the, the early days of, of loss, feeling like my world will never be right again. I will feel nothing but this extreme pain for the rest of my life. And it's not, it's not that way. The, the, the life that we have is different but it comes with many collateral blessings and beauty and joy and laughter. And it will always have its moments of missing your loved one, always. But it will also be beautiful again in a different way. So hang on to that thought because if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. And that's what I want to leave you with. Um, I can ramble on this till the cows come home. But Dave, I'm going to hear your thoughts for Lori. Well, I, I think... 
for I could echo pretty much everything that Linda said, Lori. Um, and again, please accept my condolences uh, for the loss of your child, um, for the death of your child. Um, for me, I think I would echo what Linda said in terms of what I had to learn to do was not feel guilty when I was feeling moments of joy. And also, rather than suppress the sadness, suppress any anger, was kind of just embrace it and run with it. Um, grief is kind of a microcosm of really realistically what we experience in life. Life isn't all about happiness. It isn't all about euphoria. It's this kind of kind of mosaic of emotions that kind of coexist with each other and to make us who we are. Um, it's a process to get to the raw from the raw pain of grief to the point where you've accepted the finality of loss and and understanding that you're living in a world that's forever changed and different. Um, take your time, take baby steps, take as long as it's going to take. The thing is moving forward. What also helped me in early in the early in the early years was support from other parents who under who understood my pain. I all I found it very comforting to be able to pick the brains of somebody who was 15 or 16 years on the path of, I walk on the path of somebody who experienced the death of a child because I want to say, how did you get there? How did you do that? Because yeah. I can't see a light at the end, end of the tunnel. So avail yourself of support, ask questions. For me, there isn't any aspect of the grief journey that I haven't explored. So I'll, I'll talk to anybody about anything. Um, what also helped me was embracing very different non-traditional perspectives that allowed me to to embrace a peaceful perspective and realize that um, maybe this is only one part of the journey, um, a very challenging and uneven part of the journey, but that this is only one part of that. So embracing the perspectives of after death communication, reincarnation, um, Native American teachings of animals and, and nature, all of that has kind of helped provide some clarity and the realization that maybe this is only this is only one part of our existence and that we are going to be reunited again and that they are truly continue to be with us so beautiful beautiful thank you dave i appreciate you joining us on the show again tonight it's always a a, a treat for me to um you know have you on and and share your vast wisdom with us and your experiences and um you know, it's, I just enjoy you very much. So I look forward to having you on again. And for viewers, uh, Dave, where can viewers contact you if they have a question or want to connect with you? Well, they can contact me right on Facebook. Um, you know, okay. as long, you know, if they send me a friend request, I'll be glad to accept it as, you know, as long as I know it's, it's, uh, you know, as, as a, as a result of, of the show, um, they can email me at, uh, Bootsy and Angel, um, at, at gmail.com. They can find me on my website, which is www.bootsyandangel.com. Um, I'm, I'm not that difficult to find. And at this point, I'm not going anywhere. So I'm going to be around. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And if you don't mind typing your email address or uh, how they can connect with you in the thread. And uh, that would be wonderful. So thank you for joining us. And viewers, um, once again, welcome to 2019. And for those of you that are struggling, there's still time to join us on the Journeys to Hope cruise. Uh, we depart out of Cape Canaveral uh, March 3rd. And so it's coming up really fast. And there are over 20 grief experts who will be on that cruise, all dedicated and focused on the guests who were there as part of the Journeys to Hope cruise. And I'm really excited, I'll be presenting. I will be uh, presenting a, a number of things, one of which is Hugs from Heaven. And um, I, it'll be my first cruise, so I'm very excited. A little nervous, <laughs> but very, very excited. So uh, for more information on that, you can go to my website, lindafell.com, and uh, the information is free. And I hope to see you there. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, Dave, once again, thanks so much, so much for joining us. And viewers, I appreciate you joining us. And we will see you right here, same time next week, and continue the conversation. So take care and have a good night, everyone. Good night. Bye, Dave.